Straight to the end. Ah, that's the beauty. your exam yeah. you want to take a look make sure when you leave it comes back in here before you leave so cool. i thought about bringing my jacket but i was like no oh, it'll be warmer in the classroom no it won't <laughs> So people are still getting their exams. They should be out for that. Should be out for They're alphabetical. Okay. So take a look at your exam. Make sure when you leave, it comes back in the basket. Your, your grade is on the very last sheet. So look on the very last sheet for your grade. And what you will notice is on Moodle, there is a four point curve on the exam. So we're giving everybody just a few minutes to look at exams. Exams, what's your exam? They're alphabetical. If you're done. Oh, Any questions? You have to look on the calendar. Okay. I don't remember. I think I don't remember all the. Uh, you said it's just on little for the curve part. Yeah. Okay, so it's not on that pair at a four point. And the grades are already posted to move. Okay. Any questions? 
So just make an appointment with me. All right. So today, let's see. Uh, here's our, our joke is more of a riddle. What can you catch, but you can never throw? A cold. A cold. I like cold. Yeah. So does Charles. Charles really likes the riddle. Okay. So today we are talking enzyme kinetics. Enzyme kinetics. Y'all ready for this? 
it's really cool. It's really, really cool. So um, when we look at chemical reactions, right, we can look at structurally how they work, but then we can also quantify the kinetic rates of all of those reactions, which um, is enzyme kinetics. So you have to understand um, free energy. You have to understand equilibrium, which we've already talked about, right? And so we're going to add a few more things to that today. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is our reaction velocity. So our reaction velocity is just the speed of our reaction, right? How fast is the reaction going? We have to know our substrate concentrations, right? And that's what we do, the little brackets, that's concentration. You need to know your rate constant. Your rate constant, this is a small k. It's kind of easier to see small k as cursive, you know, instead of the big k, because what is big k? What? Big, big K is equilibrium, like KD, KA, right? So be careful with big and little K. A lot of people will get those confused. So our rate constant for the reactions that we're gonna work on, these are all first order reactions. Go back to Kim 10, probably 106. What do first order reactions depend upon? the initial substrate concentration. So it depends on Okay, so in order to calculate velocity, we're going to take the rate constant of our reaction times our substrate concentration. So what are our units for velocity? If substrate concentration is molar, anybody know what your unit for Little k, it's time to the negative one, so seconds to the negative one. So what's our, our formula for velocity, our formula, our units? Ms negative one, All right? Okay, so do you remember when we were looking at the reaction diagram? And we saw all the different peaks that the intermediates made. And we wrote out that really big, long equation of what actually happens with an enzyme and a substrate. Remember that? We're going to simplify it. Because some of those um, reactions you can assume are not going to go in reverse. And some you can assume are going to happen really, really quickly. So if you look at this, what are we kind of leaving out compared to what we talked about before? What are we leaving out? Remember we said you have your enzyme binds to your substrate. So then you get an enzyme substrate. Then what happens? Your substrate turns into an intermediate. Then your intermediate turns into, good morning, product. Yes, product. Then the enzyme is going to kick out the product, right? Okay, so there are some things that we can kind of assume are only going to go in one direction. So we can assume that once you make that product, that you're not going to go backwards, right? So we can assume, we can assume that our enzyme product is not going to turn back into enzyme substrate. So we can assume this is not going to happen. So do you see how we just kind of left it off of this equation? Do you see enzyme product together? Do you see EP in our typed equation here? No, it's not there because it's not going to go backwards. So we can basically skip that entire part of the equation. And then um, we can assume that when we have an enzyme product, we're going to really, really rapidly go to enzyme plus product that this is going to be very rapid. But because it happens so quickly, we don't need to talk about it. We don't need to mathematically account for it. So what are we actually looking at? Really only two steps. The two um, important steps in terms of the rate of the reaction. We have our enzyme plus substrate going to enzyme substrate. And then our enzyme substrate going to enzyme kicking out product, right? 
because that happens very, very, very quickly. So we really have only two, um, two different reactions that we have to quantify the rate for, and then only one of them goes in the forward and the opposite direction. The other one's only going in the forward direction. Yeah? Okay. So when we do this, let's, let's, let me back up just a second. When we do this kind of um, mathematics, right? A lot of times we want to know how fast the reaction is going to go dependent upon what the substrate is, what the enzyme is, that kind of stuff. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put things in a test tube and we'll look at them versus time. So when we're monitoring any given reaction, what happens as we progress in time? As time progresses, what happens to our substrates? We initially start out what? Very high and we end up low. So this is our substrate. Right. Okay. Now, what about our product? We start out basically at zero. And what happens to our product? It goes up. So, if I'm going to look at the kinetics of a reaction, what do I want to monitor? It's preferable to monitor products because you're starting out with basically nothing. And it's very easy to see a small change. If you're starting out with a ton, a substrate, how you tell a ton minus a little is very difficult. So we monitor product. So, so um, if you're gonna look at either of those two things in the lab, we look at product. But when we do these mathematical um, calculations, what we do is we look at graphing our product versus time. So if I graph the amount of product versus time, what is that graph going to look like? Basically a straight line, right? And it's going to keep going up. Now, what happens as I increase my substrate concentration? What's going to happen to my rate? Well, let's, so, so this is one reaction. So I have one X substrate. What happens if I have 10 X? my rate is going to go faster, right? So that's 10x. What happens if I do 1,000x? It's going to get higher and higher, but add smaller and smaller increases in rate. So you actually end up having something that looks, and I am terrible with this pen. Let's see if I can do this really well. So it plateaus. The difference will get smaller and smaller and smaller until you, you can't tell, right? I could keep adding substrate. I could add a million X substrate. Would it actually change the rate of my reaction? At a point, no, it would level off, right? Y'all agree with that? Yeah? Okay, so now if we take this data and I take the rate of reaction one, the rate of reaction two, the rate of three, the rate of four, the rate of five, and I plot them versus initial substrate concentration. So this was reaction one, two, three, four, five, six, and we kept going seven, eight, nine. If I plot that initial substrate concentration versus the velocity of my reaction, Yes, as I add more substrate, my velocity is going to increase until I get to a point where it doesn't matter how much substrate you add, you're gonna reach a maximum velocity. You're going to plateau. Now, this assumes, there's all of these assumptions, right? All of these assumptions. So this assumes that our substrate concentration is in massive excess of our enzyme concentration. And that makes a difference, right? So you don't want the enzyme to be the limiting factor of this, right? Because otherwise you're not really measuring kinetics 
of the enzyme. You're measuring how much enzyme you have. And that's a different story. So in order to measure enzyme kinetics, we have to put way more substrate in than enzyme present. Okay. All right. So what we say is that at some point, that initial substrate concentration gets so high that we reach a maximum velocity. Yes, ma'am. We don't want the enzyme to be the limiting factor. <clears throat> that is correct. So you have, you're assuming a very high concentration of substrate compared to your enzyme concentration. Okay. So we're reaching a max velocity inside of our reaction, right? Because we have, we have just saturated this enzyme with substrate. There is so much that you can't go any faster. This is the limit of that enzyme. So what, what do you know about, if we're assuming that we have so much substrate, tell me about the binding sites of our enzymes. Are they full or empty or somewhere in between? They are full, they are saturated. They are saturated. So now we're really looking at how quickly the enzyme can work, not on how easily it is to bind to the enzyme, but how quickly the enzyme can work. Yeah, it's very, it's very important to make that distinction. There's an awesome animation. If you watch any animation, if you haven't watched any animation so far, go watch this animation. Okay. All right, so what we really look at when we talk about enzyme kinetics is we're looking at steady state conditions. So if you look in like the fractions of seconds in the very beginning of a reaction, you have what are called pre-steady state conditions. But pre-steady state conditions um, are like where things are mixing and we don't actually wanna take measurements at that point. What we really want to measure are um, steady state conditions. So if we look at those steady state conditions, right? So our steady state conditions looked like this, right? This was what, just from the previous slide, where we were looking at our substrate concentration um, versus our initial velocity, right? This is just the graph from before. So if we look at that, we reach a maximum velocity. So we call this V max. That's as fast as that enzyme can work. And we know that because we're using steady state conditions. In the pre-steady state conditions, do you see how you have some enzyme, this blue line is enzyme? You have some unbound enzyme, but what happens when we get to that steady state point? all of the enzyme is bound. So you see a decrease in lone enzymes and you see a steady state amount of enzyme substrate. And that's what you have to have in order to do all of these kinetic studies. Okay. So this is our Vmax. Now, if you take half of that, if you go halfway down, so we call this one half Vmax. And you tick over to your, your graph here and you come down. This substrate concentration at Vmax is called Km. I'm going to show you this on some other graphs, but it's kind of nice to be able to draw your own to know what all these things are. So Km is called the Michaelis Mitten constant. So so K for constant, M for Michaelis Mitten. So the Michaelis Mitten constant is actually a measure of what? M E M I C H A L Michaelis Mitten. It's binding affinity. 
KM is binding affinity because we're actually looking at substrate, right? It's a substrate concentration. And that's what we said binding affinity was really, right? So KM is really a ratio of the breakdown versus the formation of, of our, our, our product, right? That our enzyme can do. So if we actually look at the math, right? So the michaelis mitten is really describing our rates of breakdown and formation. So if you look at the top, what is K minus one and K two? What do these things refer to? Go back. Uh, was it this one? No, one more. Go back. Do you see these? Do you see these? These are the rates that determine whether the reaction is going to proceed in the forward or the reverse direction. So we're looking at breakdown versus formation, right? So go back. Let's see, can I copy this? Will it let me copy? I wish I could copy and paste. It's okay. Okay. So if we do this, right, we got E plus S. This is K1, K minus one goes to, and it's really a reverse. So E, S, K2, E plus P, right? Okay. So if we look at this, right? So we have the K minus one and the K2. All of those things are taking your enzyme substrate and either breaking it down this way for the K minus one or breaking it down, that's K minus one, or breaking it down this way with K2. Either way, what you're doing is you're breaking down the enzyme substrate complex. K1 is the one where you are building the enzyme substrate complex. So the michaelis mitten constant tells us our rates of breakdown and formation, which are really, which are really binding affinity. Right? So we can look at the binding affinity. We can look at the, the rates, the michaelis mitten constant of say different enzymes for the same substrate. Or we can look at um, the same enzyme for different substrates, right? Either way. So if you want to mathematically calculate the initial velocity, there's a formula for that. And I'm not gonna go through how it gets derived. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna say, if you need it, you'll, I think this one is on the equation sheet, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this one's on the equation sheet. So you, you don't have to be able to derive it. You don't have to be able to remember it. Um, but there is an equation that you can use and it's Vmax times our substrate concentration over Km plus our substrate concentration, right? And that will tell us our velocity of our reaction. Well, that's really nice. So we can look at a graph and we can say, okay, here are some typical michaelis mitten enzyme kinetic parameters. I have one enzyme and I have one substrate. What I am gonna do is I am gonna change my concentration of enzyme. The red line, I have high concentration of enzyme. The green line, I have low concentration of enzyme. So tell me about Vmax. So let's say as you, let's talk about as you um, decrease concentration of enzyme. Tell me about Vmax, what happens to Vmax? It gets lower. Does that make sense? Vmax goes down, right? I don't have to write Vmax again. Does it make sense? You have less enzyme there. So you start out with the same amount of substrate, but you have less enzyme. So is your reaction going to proceed at the same rate? No, your Vmax is going to go down. Okay. Now, is your one half Vmax the same? If Vmax is not the same, one half Vmax cannot be the same. So one half Vmax has to go down. But what do you notice about Km? Km is the same. It is what? Constant? It's the michaelis mitten constant. It's a constant for any given enzyme substrate pairing. 
So it doesn't matter how much enzyme you have, the binding affinity is the same. And mathematically, we can show that. Isn't that so cool? On a Monday? <laughs> yeah, not really, right? <laughs> so you could do this same thing for different enzymes for the same substrate. You could do um, uh, different substrates for one enzyme and say, okay, what's, what's the KM for the different substrates? Like, does it like one substrate more than another substrate? And I, I love to give my proteins personalities. So does it like, you know, but sometimes looking at these graphs is kind of a challenge. So what scientists have done is they linearize the information, right? Do, so do you see how we have a curve here? If I want to linearize something, what am I going to do to it? I take the reciprocal, right? I, I just take the reciprocal. So if we said before, if we said before, really our equation for our velocity, do you remember that? Is V max times our substrate concentration over Km plus our substrate concentration, right? That was just from the previous slide. So all I do is to linearize it is to take the inverse. So do you see how everything is over one, basically? Yes, you can do it. You can prove it to yourself, right? Okay, so now I, the whole point of doing this is to linearize it to make it easy to read. So if I look at this, if I'm gonna turn it into a linear line, what's the equation of a line? Y is equal to MX plus B. So now all we have to do is figure out what is Y, what is, what is X and all that kind of stuff, right? So what is y? Let's see, y is one over our velocity, one over our velocity. So that's what they put on the graph here, right? So if I look at x, what is x? X is going to be my km over my, my v max. So m is really when we talk about a line, it's really what? The slope. So I've taken the graphed data from the previous page and we've turned it into what's called the line weaver Burke because we linearize it. Okay, so what does that make X? What is X? It's really one over substrate concentration, right? So there's one over substrate concentration. What is B? One over V max. In a graph, what is B? It's the y-intercept right there. So I can look at one over V max really quickly. What's my V max for my equation, right? Just by looking at the y-intercept. But you just have to realize it's the reciprocal, right? So my red line, one over V max is lower, right? But if I go back, my red line, V max is really what? higher for the red line. Yes? All I'm doing is looking at the reciprocal. So if it's low here, if I undo the reciprocal, it's high. Yes? Okay. So I can very easily look at things like Vmax. Km is really cool because Km is going to be your x-intercept. One over negative Km ends up being your x-intercept. So I can look at y-intercept, x-intercept, and slope and get lots of information from this. So Lineweaver-Burke is, is probably the preferred method of like data analysis. You actually look at your results. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is really how do we know our enzyme is really efficient or not, right? And that efficiency is dependent upon a couple of different things, right? So really it's dependent upon how easily you can bind to your substrate and how quickly you can catalyze that reaction, right? So it's really twofold. So what did we say KM really was? KM is binding 
affinity. If Kf is binding affinity, do I want that binding affinity to be high or low? Like, do I want the value to be high? Because it's a substrate concentration, right? It's concentration of substrate. You want it to be low. You want it to be, we'll say small, right? A small concentration of substrate. Now, K cat is my turnover number. So when I talk about turnover number, turnover number is really how many substrates am I turning into products, right? Really pretty simple, but we're always gonna be at, acting under saturating levels of substrate because if you weren't, then that's actually dependent upon something else, right? So turnover number is how many, the number of products going to, not products, uh -huh, substrates going to products. So do we want the turnover number to be high or low? We want it to be high. We want this to be high. For the perfect enzyme, we want a really high turnover number and we want a really low Michaelis-Minton constant. So the binding affinity is telling you at what concentration of substrate does your enzyme act optimally, right? So if you have an enzyme where you only need a little bit of substrate, that means that all that substrate is very quickly binding to the enzyme. If you have a concentration of substrate that's very high for your binding affinity, that means you have to put a ton of substrate into that test tube in order to have the enzyme, all the enzymes bind at all the active sites. So which one's gonna be more efficient? The one that required a little bit of substrate or the one that required a ton of substrate? A little bit, right? So we're setting up the optimal condition. So we're setting it up. What is, so we're looking for catalytic efficiency. What enzyme is going to be the most efficient at catalyzing reaction X? Well, it's gonna be dependent upon two things. It's ability to turn over substrates to products and its ability to bind substrates, right? And you just have to remember that that binding affinity is really a KD. It's a disassociation constant. So you want it to be small. Yeah? So the more that it, like the higher the binding affinity, the more substrate it requires? Yes. Cool. Yes. Yes. So from that, from those two things, we determine catalytic efficiency. So catalytic efficiency is called K-cat, which is our turnover number, divided by our K-m, which is our Michaelis-Minton constant. And that's going to be unique for every enzyme substrate pair. Yeah? Okay. I want to... I'm going to do something a little different because y'all like y'all are nodding yes, but I don't I don't necessarily believe you. <laughs> so I'm gonna, we're going to try this. We're going to try this. I want y'all to think about this, and I want you to talk. I want you to talk to everybody. Like I want you to talk. I'm going to try and move this. Okay. So here's so here's an example of something I might ask you. Right. So we have an enzyme. It's called carbonic anhydrous. So it maintains a buffering system in our blood, right? It can use two different substrates. So we have one enzyme, we have two substrates. Use the table to determine the best choice for substrate and explain why. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna make you do this on the clicker because we only use the clicker, clicker for attendance. But what, it, what is the first column here? This is K cat. What is K cat? Turnover. Our turnover number. 
turnover number. What is this second column? The Michaelis Minton constant. Michaelis Minton. That's supposed to be MM. Just going to write MM. Michaelis Minton. Okay, and what is this last column? Catalytic. Catalytic efficiency. All right. I want you to tell me what is the best sub what is the best substrate for this enzyme and why. Don't answer right away. Think about it and then talk to the people around you. I know it's it's kind of hard to see. I don't think I can make this, I don't think I can make it bigger. I wasn't planning on using it. <laughs> so um so we're looking at carbonic anhyd anhydrous right here. It has a substrate of CO2. It has a turnover rate of one times 10 to the six. michaelis minton constant of 1.2 times 10 to the negative two. And then it has a catalytic efficiency of 8.3 times 10 to the, is that a seven? Looks like a seven. It's really small. Can I blow it up? It's so is it still, wait, let me see, watch, zoom, so yeah, so I can, but I have to be able to do this, oh goodness, yeah, so, so which one, I know, I know, but y'all can jot it down real quick, it's, well, it's on, it's on Moodle, it's on your, your slides, right? And it's, it's a table from your textbook if you want to pull up your textbook. But this is the enzyme. These are the two substrates, your KCAT, your KM, and then your catalytic efficiency. So which one? Talk about it. Which one and why? You don't really need the answer choices. Which one and why? And y'all can chat on it on Zoom if you want. Okay, you want me to show you all the answer choices? So you know? So watch. So you have to pick CO2 or HCO3 minus, and then we're asked about specificity constant or michaelis minton constant. Yeah, I can't make it. I, I hate that I can't. So let's do full screen for that. Okay, so what do you say? So, okay, so let's do it this way. CO2 or HCO3 minus? Okay, so we're, we're, we've got CO2. That is correct. CO2 is the, the preferred substrate. Um, why did you say that? Because you're looking for catalytic efficiency. You want, right, to find the optimal, you want a very high catalytic efficiency. Okay, so now, does, is one of the answer choices say the highest catalytic efficiency? No, it doesn't, right? So now you have to kind of go back and say, well, how did I get this really high catalytic efficiency? So what do you say, A or B? Okay, so if we look, if we compare the two, we're going to, yeah, let's see. Full screen. Nope, that's not what I wanted. I just, uh, it's already zoomed. I just got to remember to scroll over. Okay. So if I look at the two of them, if I look at KCAT, KCAT, do we want this to be very high or very low? We want to be very high. So which one has the highest KCAT? 
CO2 has a CO2 has the highest, right? So we have a very high comparatively K cat. Tell me about KM. You want it to be low. Gosh, that's really close. That's really close. 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2 and 2.6 times 10 to the minus 2. So it's about double, but it's relatively for enzymes relatively closer. So what do we want here? We want high or low. We want low, right? Because this is going to be the denominator in our catalytic efficiency. Yes, ma'am. Is specificity constant the same as No, this is the specificity constant. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Is specificity constant the same as K cat? It will see. Yes. Talk back up. I'm going to use yes. Yes. So if we look at the two, so let's look here. Okay, so tell me about KM. Which one has a lower KM? Okay. So now you're going to look and look for an answer choice that tells you either my K cat's really high or my KM is really low. So if I go look in my answer choices, right? I hate that it's like this, right? The Michaelis Minton constant is lower. That's not. Yeah, that's right. So, okay. So, wait, I gotta do the whole thing. New screen, full screen. Okay. So CO2, the specificity constant is higher. And then CO2, the Michaelis Minton constant is lower. So this, if the specificity constant, that's KM. If KM is higher, no, 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 I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. KM, if I could write it there. KM, the Michaelis Minton constant is lower. So, oh, did I move this? It, it auto did that. When, it auto did that when I changed. When nice. Okay, so KM here is lower in CO2. So then your specificity constant is what? For CO2 in A? K cat. K cat. So A and B would both be correct. Which one is going to have the greatest effect on catalytic efficiency? You have way different, you have way different values. I've, a, I've written right over them, right? 10 to the six versus 10 to the five. What's going to have a bigger effect? The specificity. Yeah. Oh, because it's negative. You're right. Because it's negative. It has a higher KM. No, no, no. They're both no, no, no. the same decimal, but Zero one's point. a higher decimal than the other. Zero yeah, you're, you're not going to see a big difference here. This isn't going to change that much. You're 10 to the minus two. You're not going to have a huge difference. The huge difference that you get here is because of KCAT. Okay. Yeah. So look for really big differences. Look for really big differences. A small binding affinity is not going to make that big of a difference. Okay. I think, where were we? Oh my goodness. Here we go. We're almost done with this section. Almost done. Yes. Full screen. Okay. Yes. A. The answer was A. Because the biggest effect was your, um, uh, your KCAT. KCAT had the biggest effect. Okay, so now that we kind of know how fast reactions go and how we can analyze them, what are things that will, if you have the same substrate, you have the same enzyme, right? What are things that are going to affect the rate of those reactions? pH and temperature are the two biggest ones. Do all enzymes work at the same pH? No. no. How does pH actually affect um, enzyme function? 
Okay, so if you go to the extremes, it will denature. Absolutely. But even a variation within a small frame, how can you change an enzyme's function by changing pH? The side chain residues, right? Each side chain has a unique isoelectric focusing point. So if you change the pH, you are going to change the chemical nature of the side chains that are in the enzymatic pocket, right? So you, if you don't have the catalytic triad ready to go in chemotrypsin, right? Is it gonna work? No, it's only gonna work at certain pHs. So that's why pH is super, super important. Do all enzymes work at the same pH? No. Anybody know what pepsin is, the orange line? Yeah, where is it? In the stomach. What do you have in your stomach? Hydrochloric acid, right? Super low pH. It works at pH 1.6. Most other enzymes in the body are not going to function at all at 1.6. So take a couple of different ones. These are um, liver enzymes. Um, these liver enzymes work at much different pHs. We kind of think of the pH of the body close to seven, right? But locally, you can have very different concentrate, very different um, pHs, right? Um, and so one of those is arginase that works at pH 9.7. But what if you are at, let's say pH eight, who's functional? both glucose 6-phosphatase and arginase, right? But pepsin's not. So um, the other thing is temperature. So what temperature do most of our cells work at? 37, right? Um, but there are some organisms that don't live in the conditions we live in. Think about the organisms that are like at geothermal vents. Right? So that's where uh, TAC polymerase, where have you heard TAC polymerase before? In PCR, this is the temperature stable um, enzyme that replicates DNA, right? Because you're doing this PCR at really, really high temperatures. Are our polymerase is going to work? No, absolutely not, right? And so ours are much, much similar, more similar to E. coli. Um, they work optimally at 37. Whereas TAC polymerase works optimally at 80 degrees. Isn't that amazing? Like that's really cool. Most of the time, by the time you get to 80 degrees, most of your stuff's getting denatured. So it's really amazing. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about a little bit more about regulation of enzyme activity. Um, so you know that things can bind to proteins and regulate their activity. Well, enzyme for proteins, right? So things can bind to enzymes and regulate um, their activity in either a stimulatory way or an inhibitory way. So there are two mechanisms that we can regulate enzyme activity. And we talked about this before, right? We said bioavailability. And how do we control bioavailability? Covalent modifications is one. What else? That's control of catalytic efficiency, but bioavailability. Sequestering is one. Expression, right? Remember that expression and turnover? How much you make and then how much you break it down? Remember that? We talked about that in the very beginning. So that's bioavailability. Um, and then the other part of that is we can control catalytic efficiency through things like phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. Those are protein modifications, right? So when we talk about how much is there, bioavailability, right? You're gonna take your, your gene that's in the DNA, you're gonna make RNA out of it, you're gonna process it, and you're gonna turn that RNA into your particular enzyme. So there are a couple of things that could be done to it, right? We could, if we don't really want it, conditions changed, we start breaking down, right? That's degradation. We could actually enzymatically cleave it depending on the conditions. Like if your pH changes or your temperature changes, you could actually 
cut it up into pieces and maybe this is inactive, but now that we process it, oh, now it's active, right? So some things that operate at weird pHs do that. You can covalently modify it. You can add a phosphoryl group. You can remove a phosphoryl group, right? You can have other molecules bind to it. So you can have inhibitors. You can have um, things that help binding, right? So inhibitors are, are negative, and then you can have things that are positive regulatory. Uh, molecules. And then you can actually send it to particular places. So this is kind of like sequestering. If we want it in the membrane and it only works in the membrane, if we don't send it to the membrane, it's never going to do its job. Right? So kind of like um, cell, subcellular location. Right? Okay. So when we talk about inhibition, basically what we're talking about is when we're going to take a regulatory molecule and we're gonna bind that regulatory molecule to it. What happens to change the catalytic activity of that enzyme? So there are two different ways that this can happen. Either the regulatory molecule can bind reversibly, which means that it'll bind, but it'll also leave. So these are usually non-covalent binding of little things. So remember when we talked about um, uh, hemoglobin, what was a uh, reversible? Inhibitory reversible. 2,3 BPG, right? That was a small molecule that when bound changed the affinity of the hemoglobin to oxygen, right? Okay, so it can be decreased by diluting the enzyme reaction. So if you have less inhibitor per volume, then it, it's going to, it's going to um, lessen the activity of your inhibitor. Right? So you have three different classes and we're gonna talk about each of these, these classes. You can have competitive, you can have uncompetitive and you can have mixed. And we'll talk about each of these individuals. The other way that you can have something bind is it's irreversible. It's a covalent bond or it's a really, really strong non-covalent bond um, that's gonna interact basically at the active site. And once it does, it's stuck. It is not going anywhere. So it actually kills the enzyme by blocking that active site and the enzyme like doesn't exist and it never will, it'll never come back. And so whether you dilute the solution or not, if the enzyme's bound, you're done. So that's like the, the, the kill the enzyme, right? Are we time? All right, so we'll finish this. It's not much left. We'll finish this next time. Yep. Don't forget exams in the basket. Yeah. Yeah. Which is tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to change that. Okay. So you'll probably gonna change. It gives you a link when you see your Yeah. Um, I'm ashamed of my mistakes I made. Are they beta sheets? No, I put beta barrels for two dimensions. No, I'm going to change it. That's what they were just, oh, yeah. just said. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, somebody left the water. So do you want that later? Thank you. No extra credit. How do you how do you start? You got time? Where are you going? You got time? You want to come? Okay. Let me close this stuff off. Oh, I think my Zoom is still going.